All right then. So we're uh, we're going to begin up here in Laywarden. It's a map. Yes, it's an 18th century map. So, can you see where you are on this map? I'm just going to say <laughs> I'm going to start this uh, talk in Laywarden, which is up there on the map. That is in the north of uh, the Netherlands. It's not Holland. Uh, the Netherlands is actually a series of provinces. And Friesland is in the very north of that. And they have their own language, which I can't make out at all. So, <laughs> While I was there, I heard that there was this 18th century planetarium kind of in the next town over, like a 15 minute train ride. So of course we went there. <laughs> because why not? And so I'm here to tell you about this incredible planetarium um, that, is, that was built into this little canal house in Franeker, Friesland. And you can see the sign over the door there. It was built by Isa Isinga, who was an 18th century Frisian woolcomber and an amateur astronomer. I know what you're thinking. What is a woolcomber? I'm glad you asked. A wool comber uh, takes the raw wool from the sheep and prepares the fibers and then has it dyed and spun into yarn and then it is made into fabric. Now, um, Isinga's wool was specialized for making worsted wool, which was a luxury product in that day. He was for very fine suits and gowns. And, um, he came from a whole long line of wool combers in Friesland. This is, a, uh, this is a working class occupation, even if you're making a luxury product. So uh, going to school was not something you did if you were a wool comber. However, in Friesland, it was totally encouraged to be self-educated. And mathematics and astronomy were practically national pastimes there. So, that was especially respected if you had a sideline of something. Isinga's father, uh, Jelta Isinga, built sundials as a sideline. And both father and son shared a strong interest in mathematics and astronomy and natural philosophy, or as we like to call it now, science. science. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, Isa Isinga set himself up in business in the university town of Franeker. He married, he had two kids. He had a wool business, he did really well. He specialized in this particular color of blue. Blue dyes uh, were hard to make permanent and he made a lot of innovations in that area. And he even developed new colors of blue. Blue. <laughs> and one day in 1774, astronomers over in Dresden predicted a rare conjunction of planets. Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon were all going to line up in their orbits uh, relative to the Earth. And that's kind of exciting if you're an astronomy buff. However, a Frisian preacher, the Reverend Ilko Alta, who was also a gifted veterinarian and an amateur natural philosopher, thought this was a little bit scary, and so he wrote a pamphlet and contended that this event would pull the Earth out of its natural orbit. <laughs> the publishers of his book, Smelling a Hit, uh, marketing, marketed this book as a prediction of the end of the world, and so people feared that the planets would start smashing into each other or something, <laughs> and a mild panic ensued. <laughs> Meanwhile, Isa Isinger had already begun work building an orrery into his house because he's like, hey, babe, let's build an orrery in our house. <laughs> Why not? He wanted to track the movements of the planets without having to do all the calculations by hand, and he created a number of models to test the mechanism for it and made this sketch to show the wife how it would look. The imminent end of the world was just extra pressure to get it done. And the story is that he wanted to show his neighbors what was really going on in the sky so that the next time something interesting happened, they wouldn't all freak out. And that's a really good story, and we don't want to let facts get in the way of a good story, so I'll just leave that right there. <laughs> so 
So he's wool combing by day and dying. Thanks, Blue. And uh, spending all his free time building this planetarium suspended from the ceiling of his house in the same room where his family slept and ate. The bed there is in the wall cupboard. It's behind the curtain in this drawing. Originally meant to be a six-month project, but put a few more details in and, you know, got a little more complicated, and then you had to figure out how to make it all work and so on. But when it was done, he, uh, he painted it all this beautiful color of blue and added hand lettering so that everybody would know what, what was what, gilt leaf, some accents, and it was just um, absolutely gorgeous and really uh, in very good taste. Actually, I think celestial ceilings as decor are always in very good taste. <laughs> but they are way, way better if they work. The final touches were put on this ceiling in 1781 after over eight years of work. It could be worse. It could be worse. I, I have heard of other guys with obsessive building projects in their living rooms. Yeah, I know what you're thinking now. How does it work? Well, I'm glad you asked. First, there's the scale. This planetarium fits into a ceiling that is only 12 feet wide, and so it was constructed to a scale of one to one trillion. So that's one millimeter to one million kilometers. Incidentally, my living room ceiling is also 12 feet wide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the planets uh, in the ceiling appear much larger because otherwise they'd be totally invisible. And though their orbits are circular rather than elliptical in this model, the circles, as you'll notice, are not concentric, and that means their relative positions remain accurate. The immense workings with over 60 handmade wheels that fit in the narrow space between the, the ceiling that you see in the room and the floor joists of the attic above uh, include over 6,000 hand-hammered iron nails used as cogs for all these gears. This entire mechanism is driven by a simple pendulum clock that also is a pacemaker for all these other dials that indicate with near perfect accuracy even 230 years later the date, the day of the week, the hour, the phases of the moon, the rising and setting times of the moon and the sun. A slight resetting of some of these must be done every four years or so to compensate for leap year. Leap year. The sun and the earth are those gold balls hanging lower in the room, but everything else is a little bit closer up to the ceiling. And these are all moving constantly in real time. Here is the pendulum clockwork in the crawl space above this ceiling. There's a small bob at the end of the pendulum. Can you see that? The entire thing is in constant motion, and that pendulum is the only thing you really can see moving. And when he calculated the size of everything, uh, he was using a one meter long pendulum that would swing at 60 strokes per minute, of course, because it's a clock and it makes the math easier. Only when he said about the physical building of this did he realize that the, uh, the ceiling space wasn't quite tall enough for a one meter pendulum. So. Yeah, well, he had to figure it out, you know. Maybe the floor wasn't level or something, I don't know. So he planned to cut a little channel in the wood above the bed so that the pendulum could swing freely over it. <laughs> Again, the, the bed is right under all this stuff. And at this point, Madame Isinga had a little something to say about it. <laughs> understandably worried about being brained by a pendulum bob in the middle of the night. <laughs> and seeing ro no room for negotiation, Isa recalculated the entire gearing system on the basis of a fast swinging pendulum only 75 centimeters long, which ticks at 80 times per minute. This complicated the math somewhat. Um, <laughs> yeah, safe, exactly. And, uh, Anyway, this all runs off weights, which are housed in the closet to the right of the bed there. Um, the pendulum clock runs off a single weight, but the mechanism that powers the rest of the orrery runs off of eight weights, 
that are connected to the main axles that eliminate nearly all of the resistance. So when this thing turns, it's totally silent. And that is really good if you and your entire family are trying to sleep in that room. <laughs> Obviously, when it was finished, word got out that there was this sort of fabulous thing happening in this house. And so Isaac invited his neighbors and other villagers and school children to visit the planetarium. And he would explain the whole Wittenschip to them. <laughs> On... <laughs> and one fine day, <laughs> Uh, a university professor stumbled into the house, and uh, he was a well-published astronomer. He, uh, he was so impressed with this, its accuracy and its design, that he wrote his own paper on it, and he published it in a pamphlet that he then sent to all of his colleagues in other cities. And soon people were coming from all over the Netherlands to see this planetarium. Now, having earned the respect of the academic community, Isinga published several books on astronomy, and made plans to build an even bigger orrery so that he can include the newly discovered planet like Uranus and some other details. <laughs> However, history got in the way of his big plans. Now, I'm not a real expert on Dutch uh, history, so when the Patriot Revolution figures into this story, I'm just going to condense it, very complicated story, into it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> and those on the Patriot side uh, kind of had to get out of Dodge or they were going to be arrested for treason. And so Isinga had to flee the country rather suddenly and for far too long. During his exile, he learned that his wife died and his house had been confiscated. Unable to return to Franeker, he set himself up in Groningen. That's in the east of Friesland. It's the green area of the map. He started a new wool business, and eventually, after 15 years or so, he married again. But then he was found and extradited back to Franeker. He was sentenced to a year in jail, and after which he was to be banished from Friesland for a further five years. I know this is really sad, but really, who knew that Woolcomber's lives were so full of political intrigue? I mean, <laughs> it's kind of an adventure, really. And then do you know what happened? A miracle happened. Napoleon invaded the Netherlands. <laughs> Everybody gets out of jail. <laughs> Isa rushes back to Franeker and reclaims his house and his planetarium. He even has some more kids. Yay. And so after this, and I know you're all dying to see more of Napoleon, and I could talk about Napoleon for, oh, seven or eight hours a day. <laughs> the thing is that eventually, and I say this with great respect and love for the emperor, <laughs> but the thing is that eventually everybody gets sick of Napoleon. <clears throat> <laughs> and so the Dutch kick the French out of the Netherlands. I know, I can't drink gin either. The Netherlands became its own kingdom in 1815 under Willem I. And King Willem was also an astronomy enthusiast, and so he visited Isinga's planetarium. And he decided to buy the house outright for the state for the princely sum of 10,000 guilders. The only stipulation being that the inventor should live in, their plan in the planetarium and can continue to give explanation of the Wittenschip to the kids. <laughs> just as he had always done, and you know, it could be worse because it came along with a really nice pension for now aged Woolcomer. And it would continue also to his heirs so that they could carry on in his place after he left. Isa Isinga died in his beloved home at the age of 84 in 1828. And with the help of copious and detailed notes and instructions that he left behind, his daughter, his granddaughter, and her granddaughters maintained the orrery well into the 20th century, after which it was then given to the city of Franeker so that I could visit it and take pictures of it. <laughs> and, and I know you're thinking, you want to build one of these in your home, and you, and you certainly wouldn't be alone in that. So, um, 
Anyway, now I would like to propose a toast to to Isinger and to the, all the Frisian Wolkhomers who make this world a better place. <laughs> Thank you. Ed.